is Doris Canberry for the uh, ACC Fits on the Go blog and I have here with me Dr. Bob Franz who is the Director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic at Mayo Clinic. Um, Dr. Franz, it's an honor to talk to you um, and um, as a um, pulmonary hypertension specialist, uh, could you give us an idea as to how you got into that area and um, how was your career shaped to, 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 the, to this point? Well, I owe a big debt of gratitude to Dr. Michael Magoon, who, who was one of the pioneers in pulmonary hypertension, starting in the days when there was really no therapy available at all for pulmonary arterial hypertension. And he was involved in the, the pivotal trial that got epoprostenol approved to treat pulmonary arterial hypertension. And his vision was that we're going to need a, a clinic to take care of these patients because this is a complicated therapy with a lot of side effects and we'll have to teach people how to run these pumps and so forth. And so when I'd finished my training, I'd done research in, in animal models of heart failure and was sort of on the track of being a, a left heart failure transplant kind of doc, but also had been trained quite extensively in invasive hemodynamics and um, catheterization procedures. And so when Mike founded the pulmonary hypertension uh, clinic at the Mayo Clinic the year after epoprostenol got approved, he needed somebody to help him out. And so he came to me and said, Bob, look, you do hemodynamics, uh, you do heart failure and transplant kind of things. Would you like to get involved in pulmonary arterial hypertension? And so that's really how that, that came about. Um, and where do you see the field of pulmonary hypertension going? Is there, is there hope on the horizon for pH patients? Well, there is always hope, and you know we've gone from having one therapy available when the pulmonary hypertension clinic was founded to many therapies, all of which hit these pathways of the endothelin pathway, the PD-5 inhibitors and the nitric oxide pathway, and now Rio Ciguat, the soluble guanylate cyclase activator, which is another target in that particular nitric oxide pathway, and of course the prostanoids. And those all work well, but they're still not where we need to be in terms of anti-proliferative therapy. And so we're sort of looking for the equivalent of the drug-eluting stent and how to shut down proliferation in the pulmonary vasculature. And I think, I keep hoping that in my career, which has got about a decade to go, that this is going to happen, that we're going we're gonna to have a hit with one of these anti-proliferative strategies. So we're getting much better at treating PAH, but it still is not the outcome we'd hoped for. And so all of us remain passionate about pushing ahead with anti-proliferative trials. And with the emergence of management for pulmonary hypertension and, and um, the development of the field of uh, investigation into HEFPEF, um, th there has been a resurgence in, in interest in hemodynamics and invasive hemodynamics. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's, it's fascinating. You know, it, the, the inaugural meeting of the International Right Heart Foundation, which is basically um, dedicated to the right ventricle and understanding how it couples with the pulmonary vasculature. Um, Gene Bronwald gave this wonderful address saying that, that the right ventricle is an orphan no more. You know, it sort of has been the forgotten ventricle. And now everybody's like, okay, we've done all this work with the left heart, but the patients we really struggle with are those for whom the left heart therapy is not adequate and the right ventricle is failing and they're developing cardiorenal syndrome and they have high pulmonary vascular resistance and high rate atrial pressure. How do we deal with that? And so the interest in pulmonary hypertension, whether it be group two with left heart disease or group three with lung disease or thromboembolic disease or LVADs and RV failure after LVAD, or getting a patient safely to transplant who has biventricular failure and pulmonary hypertension. Actually, now everybody's interested in the right ventricle. And to me, I, I love uh, teaching fellows about the right heart and about hemodynamics because, number one, it's so easily done wrong, where there's a failure to understand what's really driving the pulmonary hypertension, what's the issue of cardiac output being high or low, uh, left heart pressure's high or low, and what's really driving it. And number two, it seems so translational across so many different areas of cardiology and pulmonology. And now we're starting to talk about targeting in the right ventricle in terms of its function, which is incredibly exciting. So I never would have dreamt when Mike Magoon asked if I get involved in, in pulmonary hypertension so long ago that the right ventricle would, would suddenly be kind of a uniting theme and pulmonary hypertension a uniting theme across so many areas of cardiology. 
Right. Uh, so for fellows, we should pay a little bit more attention to the right heart. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, when the right heart goes, you're in trouble and you know it, you know. So you pay attention to the right heart and pay attention to the hemodynamics because they're really important. Thank you very much, Dr. Franz.